Hey everyone, and welcome to our second brown bag of Archaeology and Historic Preservation Month here in Utah. I'm Elizabeth Bora. I'm public archaeologist at the Utah State Historic Preservation Office, and I am delighted to introduce you all today to Bim Oliver, um, writer, historian, and noted architectural consultant about town. In the years following the end of World War II, the University of Utah was in a state of crisis. Growing enrollment numbers sent administrators scrambling to find space for classes, offices, and research. Architectural historian Bim Oliver has been researching this era of university history, and he's here today to share his results. All right, Bim, if you're ready, you can take it away and share your screen. All right. Can you see the presentation? Yes, sir, we can. Okay, good. Well, thanks, Elizabeth, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what I would consider to be perhaps the most significant period in the history of the University of Utah, um, maybe even more significant than uh, the period of its de early development, simply because um, as uh, we're gonna see, if certain things hadn't happened, if certain things hadn't been in place during this period, it's highly possible that the University of Utah would not exist as we know it today. So here's what we're going to talk about uh, this afternoon. Uh, we're going to start with a, a brief history of the university itself to just provide a, a context for this post-war period that we're going to look at. Then we'll talk a little bit about the crisis that emerged after World War II. Emerged is probably actually an understatement. The crisis that uh, showed up rather immediately at the end of World War II. Uh, and then we'll switch gears and talk a little bit about Fort Douglas because the fact that Fort Douglas was located where it, where it is, um, is significant in the history of the university. And then we'll talk about a transfer of land and buildings that happened in the late 1940s um, that to a great extent resolved the crisis that existed. And finally, we'll talk about the new campus that emerged out of all of this. So let's start with a brief history of the university. Um, the, uh, the university um, has grown to a great extent because of the existence of Fort Douglas. Um, its first real campus um, uh, was created out of land that had been acquired from Fort Douglas. And as we're going to see, um, the, uh, the university uh, grew in this post-war period also as a result of a major acquisition of land from Fort Douglas. Um, this is the university in about 1920. This is an aerial view of the university. Just to kind of orient you, this is the park building at the head of what we now call President's Circle. This campus was created in 1894 when uh, Fort Douglas deeded 60 acres of land um, to the university and, uh, and the university really had its first permanent location. Up to that point, it had been something of an itinerant in institution uh, moving around uh, various places in downtown. So it had its first real campus, if you will. And in 1896, the state legislature appropriated funds to construct buildings on this site. Uh, the first buildings were completed in the early 1900s. And at that time, student enrollment was about 200. But you can see even from this picture in 1920, this is the campus at that time and it's pretty compact. Uh, it's pretty concentrated around this area that we call President's Circle. This is um, an image from 1940, just to orient you here again is the park building. This is President's Circle, which is actually really an oval, but, uh, but metaphorically, I guess we can call it President's Circle. And you can see the campus is still pretty concentrated. It's larger now, it's about 150 acres. There are about 30 buildings on campus, but it's still a relatively small uh, area of land. Um, what's important to note in this image really more so than the campus itself is this land up here. I want you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we move through the presentation because this is really kind of the critical piece uh, in, in this entire story. Um, even though the university had grown, the campus had grown a little bit, I, I guess in term, relative terms, it had grown quite a bit, but even though the campus had grown and there were more buildings, the university before World War II was still feeling the pressure of enrollment. 
Um, there were almost 5,000 students enrolled at the university just prior to World War II. During the 1940s, there were only three buildings constructed on campus. Uh, the ore dressing lab, for which we don't have an image, and I apologize to our friends in the mining field, but there's not really a reason to take a picture of the ore dressing lab, uh, architecturally probably. Um, the image on the left is of what was called the Student Health Center, which was the Student Health Center when it was completed in 1945, now serves as an administrative building. And on the right is the Naval Science Building that was uh, completed in 1946. So during this period uh, of the 1940s, um, there really wasn't any new construction on campus, certainly no new classroom buildings, no new laboratory buildings. Um, really essentially no new buildings that had the kinds of functions that the university was um, really trying to address. So now we're going to talk about what happened in the years immediately following World War II. Um, this title of the, for this section is actually the title of a book by Paul Hodson, who was an administrator at the university during this period, and his primary role was to address um, the crisis, if you will. Um, and you might say, well, aren't all those exclamation points kind of melodramatic? And the answer is to the administrators at the university during this period, they certainly would not have been. In fact, they might have been something of an understatement. It was that significant of uh, that urgent of a situation. So um, you can see here from this chart why the university administrators were feeling uh, such a strong sense of urgency. Um, just before the war, um, enrollment at the university was about 3,600. In the two years after the war, in school year 1945 to 1946 and 1946 to 1947, the university experienced enrollment growth of about 170%. In essence, within a two year period, enrollment at the university basically tripled. Um, and University administrators really had no place to put all these new students. Uh, we're talking about the same campus that we just looked at a couple of slides ago, 30 buildings um, that was already feeling uh, enrollment, or excuse me, uh, uh, um, attendance pressures, if you will, prior to the war. Uh, and now after the war, you had enrollment that was orders of magnitude greater than before the war. So what caused this uh, explosion in enrollment. The primary factor was veterans returning from World War II. There were thousands of veterans returning to Utah after World War II. They had the benefit of funding from the GI Bill to get a college education. And in that time, that was really the goal of anyone who got an education was to go to college, uh, get a degree and move on to a professional life. Uh, many of these veterans were married and their spouses were going to attend um, college as well. So you have this uh, almost immediate glut on the market of all of these people who were coming back to the United States and their spouses who were looking for places to go to school. Historically, Utah also had a high percentage of high school graduates who were entering college. Um, that was kind of a, a baseline layer, if you will, that existed prior to this post-war period, but it created a fairly high baseline layer um, that the other factors would influence significantly. President Olpin, President Ray Olpin was inaugurated in 1946. And his philosophy was that the university should be open to any and all students who wanted to attend, that it should not be exclusive. So we basically looked at a university that had an open door um, acceptance policy, not entirely, but to a great extent. And finally, the university was growing. It was adding new colleges and departments. So you combine all these factors and the chart that we looked at here makes a whole lot of sense, uh, especially again, the primary factor of veterans returning from World War II. Well, the fact that there was a crisis on campus was not a well-kept secret. Uh, this is an article from the Salt Lake Tribune in September of 1946. And you can see that um, that it also is characterizing what is going on on the university campus as a crisis. Um, the subheading, if you will, is U works against time to make room for 9,000 students. 
So there was clearly a sense of urgency that was almost palpable across the community and to the extent that local papers were picking up on the fact that the university had this explosion in enrollment and no place really to put all these new students. This is a map uh, from the university catalog during that period. And you can see that, um, again, campus is 150 acres. There are about 30 buildings. And it really isn't a whole lot bigger in, in some ways than the original campus that we looked at in 1920. Um, and yet you have this tripling in enrollment. But the real issue here is that the university needed not only new buildings, but even more to the point it needed land on which to build these buildings. Um, and part of the problem, part of the challenge for the university was that, uh, was that the ownership of land around campus was something of a patchwork. The primary owner was the military in, in Fort Douglas, if you will. Um, but there were also uh, parcels that were owned by the State Road Commission, by Salt Lake City, by the LDS Church, by the Bureau of Land Management. So to try to figure out a way to buy a large chunk of land on which to build new buildings was challenging to say the least, and really in some ways um, almost impossible. Um, and in, in 1948, President Open made the following rather significant remarks. He said, should the university fail to acquire 700 to 800 additional acres of land from Fort Douglas, the school may have to be moved elsewhere. It is conceivable that the taxpayers of the state, if they are to maintain a university to provide adequate college training to its citizens, would be obligated to move to another area remote from the present location. So imagine if you will, in 1950, the University of Utah picking up and moving to say Fillmore or Delta or heaven forbid to Provo. Um, but that was at least, I guess, conceptually a, a possibility. When I think about this comment by President Olman, Open, I think that in some ways it may have been something of an idle threat. Um, something of an idle ultimatum, but it did express the sense of urgency that he felt about the university situation at the time. Okay, so we have a university that is basically the same as it was in 1920, slightly larger, um, and yet we have enrollment that is orders of magnitude greater than it would have been at that time. So we have this pressure on the facilities of the university to respond to the growth in enrollment. So we're going to leave that for just a minute and go up to Fort Douglas. This is Fort Douglas in 1869. The, the campus, if you will, of the fort is shown in that red oval. Um, and I want you to remember that we were looking at a large parcel of land to the east of the campus of the university. That's kind of this parcel right here. Um, here's Salt Lake, the, the edge of the city, if you will. Here's the campus of Fort Douglas, excuse me, sorry. And this is um, a large parcel of land that um, was going to keep President Ray Olpin up at night. <laughs> um, this is looking west across Fort Douglas in uh, about 1920. Just to orient you here, this is the north end of the Ochres. Um, and I guess I hope you can see, can you see my cursor? Elizabeth, can you see my cursor? Let me know. Please. Yes, I can. Okay, good, thank you. I thought maybe I'm pointing and nobody can see what I'm pointing at here. Um, this is the north end of the Ochres, and in the haze here is the university campus, and in the farther haze is downtown Salt Lake. But here's the, the fort itself, and here's this large parcel of land in between the fort and the university. Here's another map a little later, 1935. This is Fort Douglas uh, proper, if you will. Um, and just to orient you here, this line here, if you can kind of make it out, is what we now know as Mario Capecchi Drive. At the time, it was called Wasatch Drive. This line here is what we now know as South Campus Drive, and at the time was known as Hempstead Road. The only development related to the fort that was west of Mario Capecchi Drive was this uh, uh, set of structures here. This was the civilian military training camp, which was a place where youth would go to get trained to be soldiers. 
But other than that, there really wasn't anything west of what we now know as Mario Capecchi Drive. Well, we went into World War II and Fort Douglas was pressed into a new and very different role um, than it had previously. In fact, it's important to note that there were conversations off and on in the history of the fort about closing the fort entirely. Um, and that's gonna kind of play a role as we come to um, this transfer that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. But at the beginning of World War II, Fort Douglas's role uh, in, in the army was significantly amped up. It became a major processing center for soldiers who were going to war and soldiers who would be returning from war. So there was a whole lot of new construction, all of which took place west of Mario Capecchi Drive. These were utilitarian buildings. They were bare bones buildings. They were considered to be temporary uh, and they were typically built along a standardized plan or standardized plans so basically any builder anywhere could build a bunch of these buildings in a, in a hurry. There were over a hundred buildings built west of Mario Capecchi Drive in about a two year period to accommodate this new, uh, more significant role of, uh, of Fort Douglas in, in the army during World War II. Here's some other examples of these buildings. Again, they, they are architecturally not beautiful. <laughs> They are just built for certain purposes and they're built to be there for just a short period of time um, and they were designed to be built quickly. So they're, you know, we're not going to look at these buildings and go, boy, what a wonderful building that is. But the fact is that they served their purposes during World War II and as we're going to see, they served their purposes after World War II. Um, I really love this image on, on the right. I kind of picture this guy getting off the bus from Richfield and taking a cab up to Fort Douglas and being dropped off in the snow where he's confronted with, you know, his future as uh, an enrollee or, or uh, as an inductee into, into the army. It's kind of a lonely photo in a way. Um, here's an image of the insides of some of these buildings. And as you can see, again, uh, they're not fancy, they're not dressed up, there's not a lot of decoration. They're there simply to serve a temporary purpose. Um, most of them were basically shells, if you will, wooden shells into which you could place any number of functions. And that's gonna be significant as we look at what happens after World War II. This is a map um, of Fort Douglas after World War II. This map was created in 1946. And just to orient you here, this is Mario Capecchi Drive here. And going right along here is uh, South Campus Drive. So you can see all of this construction that took place west of Mario Capecchi Drive. Now there is one exception, the civilian military training camp had pre-existed uh, World War II, but it was expanded and there were some dormitories built over here. But basically all of this construction occurred in a two year period from 1940 to 1942. Over a hundred buildings were constructed uh, in this area after the war. This is an aerial photo from about that period. Um, and again, here's Mario Capecchi Drive running this way and South Campus Drive heading this way. And you can see all of these buildings that are scattered now west of uh, Mario Capecchi Drive or what we now know, or excuse me, what was then called Wasatch Drive. <clears throat> all of these buildings here um, west of, uh, of Fort Douglas. So this area, that was once kind of a blank slate, if you will, has now been not filled entirely, but certainly occupied by a huge number of buildings. And just to orient you a little bit, this is a marker of the campus of the University of Utah here to the left or to the west. <clears throat> okay, so we come to the end of World War II and Fort Douglas has expanded dramatically to, uh, to uh, fulfill certain roles for the army during the war. And now these temporary buildings are vacant. So the, the fort has over a hundred buildings that were never meant to be there permanently that aren't necessarily a liability per se, but they're not really an asset either. So the military in great to great extent would just as soon get rid of these buildings. So we have a match made in heaven. In 1948, um, Fort Douglas transferred to the University of Utah 300 acres it's actually the, 
uh, technically it was 298.85 acres, but to me that's 300. I'm not a math major. Um, with over 100 buildings. Um, in addition, some buildings were imported from other sites, including places like Geneva Steel and Dugway and um, internment camps like Topaz. But this is really the critical piece in all of this. It's not the 700 to 800 acres that President Olpen was dreaming of, but it's enough to get the university to where it needs to go in the very short term. Uh, this is a map from the book that I mentioned earlier, Crisis on Campus. And if you're interested in this period of the university's history, and as I mentioned at the outset, I think in some ways this is the most significant period in the history of the university. And if you're interested in this period, um, I would encourage you to read the book. It's, again, the title is Crisis on Campus, and the author is Paul Hodson, H-O-D-S-O-N. It's available Salt Lake, uh, through the Salt Lake City Public Library. It is no longer in print, but you might be able to find a copy um, at, say, Weller Bookworks or another used bookstore. But it's really a wonderful book. It, it really describes this period in great detail. Having said that, this is a map from that book and in the red circle is the land that was acquired in this uh, transaction between the university and Fort Douglas. And I should note that the transaction was not without its problems. In fact, there had been a bill that had been in introduced in Congress to enact this uh, transfer of land, um, but the bill was um, defeated in Congress. Um, and so there was a negotiation that was undertaken between uh, the university and the War Department, which is now the Department of Defense. Um, and in fact, Dwight Eisenhower stepped in and basically said, you know, you really ought to give this stuff, the, the land and the buildings to, to the university. He was much more articulate in the way that he, uh, in, that he phrased that. But the point was, you know, there's no, no reason to keep a hold of this property anymore. And the university really has a need for it. But one thing to note is this is the campus that we were talking about prior to World War II. And all of this land here within the circle is what was acquired in that transfer in 1948. It basically tripled the land area of the university. So the buildings that we looked at earlier that were constructed during World War II, those are the buildings that the university acquired. Um, this is a motor pool building. And if it isn't this building, there's another one exactly like it that is still a standing and still used, I believe, as a motor pool building by the university. Um, there are about five or six buildings from this period that are left on campus, um, one of which is by far the most significant building from this period. And I would argue perhaps in many ways the most significant period, uh, excuse me, the most significant building uh, in the history of the university. And we're going to talk about that as we get towards the end of the presentation. But the university acquired these functional buildings and they made good use of them. Um, they also, as I mentioned, imported buildings from other places. Um, this is a set of three buildings that was brought in from Camp Kearns, which was a training facility for the Army Air Corps, um, cobbled together in essentially a U-shape to create the bookstore. This is from the 1949 yearbook, The Utonian. Um, I love the, the caption uh, of this image. It says, in spite of its enlarged dimensions, the new bookstore is still a scene of tumult during registration week. And I counted, I think there are three or four students on the steps here. Not the most tumultuous scene, uh, but perhaps this was kind of a little bit of an off time uh, for the bookstore. But I think the real theme here um, that emerges from this narrative is how remarkably resourceful and creative and innovative the university administrators and planners and workers were in adapting these buildings to their uses as university buildings. They were totally and completely inadequate for those purposes. And yet the university was able to make do with these buildings through this period in which, uh, again, if they didn't have this kind of asset, uh, it's possible the university would have considered, at least according to President Olpin, would have considered moving to some other part of the state. Um, I mentioned that the buildings were inadequate for their purposes. Well, here are a couple of examples. These are medical research buildings. At least they were adapted for those uses by the university. Um, on the left is the former ROTC stables. 
So I want you to kind of go through a little uh, scenario with me. Uh, President Olpin calls his old friend from Ohio State. That's where he came from before he took the position of president of the University of Utah. He calls her up and he says, Jane, you know, you're one of the premier medical researchers in, uh, in the country. And I believe that our university is poised to become one of the premier research institutions in the country. And in fact, that was President Olpin's primary focus as president of the university was to create a research institution out of the University of Utah. So Jane flies out, she's met at the airport by the president, they drive downtown, they have lunch at Lamb's Cafe, they drive up to campus, they walk around President's Circle and she's thinking, boy, this is beautiful. I mean, the mountains, beautiful campus. And then he says, let me show you where you're going to work. So there's the crux of the problem. The problem is that these facilities were inadequate for research, certainly of any uh, significant kind. They were very basic, they were very utilitarian. We're gonna make do with these facilities, but the problem is any researcher worth his or her salt would look at these buildings and say, this is not the place I wanna be. So the, these buildings as functional and significant as they were, were also a problem in recruiting new faculty members. And it was critical to bring in new faculty members because we have many new students, we have new programs, uh, new departments, we have to staff them with new faculty members. So the quality of these buildings or the lack of quality of these buildings was a deterrent in recruiting new faculty members. This is Stadium Village. We're gonna see it again in just a minute. Stadium Village comprised a number of buildings that were, most of which were imported from other places, including, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Topaz, the internment camp, um, there were buildings brought in from other internment camps that were basically barracks in the internment camps. This, uh, these buildings that were imported were adapted to create housing for married students. And in spite of the fact that they were pretty dilapidated, pretty ramshackle, they were kind of dressed up pretty well by university workers. There was a two year waiting list to live at Stadium Village. And finally, this is Connor Bowl, um, one of the assets that was uh, acquired by the university in this transfer of land and buildings. It was utilized a little bit after the war uh, for plays and other, and, and other events. Um, and most of it is gone now. There are some remnants of these bleachers um, just west of the intersection of Mario Capecchi Drive and, uh, and South Campus Drive. So the university had acquired a lot of buildings, a lot of land, and then in addition, some interesting facilities like this. Okay, so we've got buildings and we've got places to house students, places to teach students, places to do research as dilapidated, as ramshackle as they might be. These buildings are going to get us through this crisis uh, until we are able to start building new buildings. Well, the buildings that the university acquired were adapted to a variety of uses. And a lot of what was going on during that period, because there was so much growth, not only in enrollment, but also uh, in classes and in programs and in departments, the university administrators, space planners had to shuffle uses among buildings. So uh, a number of these buildings were adapted to a variety of uses. You know, if you look at the mess hall, for the former mess hall, for example, um, it was adapted to be the explosive research lab, then the isotope geology lab, then the electrical key and refrigeration shop, and finally a, a studio, if you will, for physical therapy. But the key building in all of this is what is known as the annex. It was adapted to more uses than any other building in university history by far. It accommodated just about every kind of use uh, that the university had at the time and even new uses that were cropping up as the university grew and expanded. And we're gonna come back and talk about this building in just a little bit. This is uh, uh, an excerpt from the 1950 to 51 catalog, as you can see. And you can see the number of buildings that were being utilized for classes and other uses. This is not an exhaustive list by any, uh, by any means because there were buildings that were being used for strictly utilitarian purposes like storage and motor pool and so forth but you can see the fact that the university was immediately 
jumping in to use these buildings for various uses, for various types of classes, for various programs, for administrative uses, really a critical stopgap measure in the history of the university. And I should note this highlighted building 105 is the annex. So by 1950, 51, it was already housing a, a fairly wide diversity of uses and that diversity of uses would grow over time. Well, one of the issues, so the fact that the university acquired these buildings was, was a godsend really. It was, it was to say the least fortuitous because now, as I mentioned, we had the space to conduct classes, to do research, to house offices, to house people, you know, dormitories and so forth. But there was, a, there was an accompanying issue related to the location of these buildings. And I wanna uh, draw your attention to the image on the right. This is a map from that period of campus. And just to orient you, here is President's Circle down here. Uh, and this is the annex here, which is the building that was farthest from President's Circle. There's a lot of space in between. And in fact, it's about a mile, the distance from the park building, which sits at the head of President's Circle, right about there, to the annex is about a mile. That means if you had a class on President's Circle and your next class was in the annex, you had to walk a mile uphill to get to your next class. Now, we're going to assume that somebody's in reasonably good shape. For them to walk a mile uphill might, you know, if they're walking reasonably fast, they might get there in say 20 minutes. That created a significant problem for university administrators because now they had to allow for all of this time between, um, uh, between classes. Uh, and they were trying to cram as many classes into as short a period of time as possible because they had all these new students and all these new programs. So there was a, a significant logistical problem with the fact that there were two campuses. Um, and in fact, as time went on, one of the issues became uh, one of the primary problems for campus planners was traffic. People didn't want to walk up the hill, so they'd get in their car and they'd drive around up to the annex. Well, you have a whole bunch of cars driving around <laughs> up to the annex between classes. Now you have now you have a traffic uh, a traffic jam, and there isn't the parking to accommodate them. But you can see on the left here's an image of students walking basically uphill to to class. Um, again, they've got to walk about a mile, um, and not only is that physically taxing, but it takes a lot of time uh, to get there. So this this distance between these two campuses was a significant issue for university planners. So I wanna play this video for you. I would encourage you to turn up your volume a little bit. The volume on this is a little bit lower and there are gonna be two videos and at the end, I'll give you a chance to turn your volume down a little bit. Th these are two clips, the following slides are two clips from a promotional video that the university produced in 1948 called Your State University. And um, these videos, uh, among other things, I think tout the fact that the university was able to utilize these buildings from Fort Douglas. So let's play them. It was necessary for the university to annex the adjoining property and idle buildings of historic Fort Douglas. There are facilities to accommodate 2,000 students in some 40 buildings used by the university. Okay, so I'm going to speak rather quietly in case you turned your volume up, but I want you to note in that last the very end of that clip, that poor soul who's walking all the way from the annex down to the main uh, or historic campus. Um, again, I think it highlights how far that distance was to get from one campus, if you will, to another. So let me play the second video for you of Stadium Village. Go ahead and turn up your volume again, if you would. a housing problem which could only be solved by a village of temporary homes. Now, as Utah's fastest growing community, this city within a city, Stadium Village, houses 301 veteran families, boasts its own store and city government. Fellow's trouble is no longer Nate's, but other distractions. Out-of-town girls of the university 
are accommodated with board and room at Carlson Hall. Some quarters have even been erected on campus to help shelter the great swarm of men students. Okay, I'm going to speak rather quietly while you turn your volume back down, but you can see from those two videos that the university was making full use of these buildings. I think they did a pretty good job of dressing up those, those buildings at University Village to make it look somewhat uh, comfortable and somewhat residential. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, even though those buildings were pretty, pretty hammered <laughs> uh, by the time the university got to use them, um, there was a two year waiting list for people to live there. So those buildings that the university acquired from Fort Douglas were obviously critical. They allowed the university to maintain its functions through this, this brief period following the World War II. But what was more important was the land that was acquired, that 300 acres. And between 1950 and 1971, the university constructed over 75 buildings. Now that includes, that number includes University Village, uh, the medical and the medical center. So um, it's a little inflated, if you will, but there was a significant number of buildings built on the 300 acres that the university acquired um, immediately after the war. The first of these is here in the upper left, that's the Sterling Sill Center. A beautiful building, really a wonderful building designed by the Utah firm of Ashton Evans and Brazier. It sits to the east of the union building across the parking lot. Uh, and then on the right, of course, is the Social and Behavioral Sciences Building, the high rise on campus that was completed in 1971. Um, but the reality is that that 300 acres came to represent the critical piece in all of this. Uh, it, it's hard to say, I suppose, at a certain level, because if the buildings hadn't been there, the university would have been stuck anyway, because it didn't have facilities for, for all of these new students. But if you look within this red shape here, this red outline, you can see all of these new buildings that have been constructed, that were constructed, most of which were constructed during this 20 year period uh, from 1950 to 1971. This is the union building here, just to orient you. Here's the Huntsman Center, and here is the annex. And I wanna end with uh, a discussion about the annex, a brief conversation about the annex. Um, the annex was by far the most significant of the buildings that the university acquired. It was by far the largest of the, of the buildings that the university acquired. It was 90,000 square feet. And in and of itself, the annex alone expanded the square footage of building stock at the university by 30%, really an extraordinary number. It was applied to the broadest diversity of uses of any building in university history by far. That included various academic departments like the English department and the psychology department. It included uh, broad uses like the Air Force ROTC and the University Employees Credit Union. And at one time, it even housed the world's largest turtle collection. So the annex was significant. And I feel that unfortunately, um, it is scheduled to be demolished this summer. And I feel that that's a truly unfortunate decision on the part of the university because this building is so significant in the history of the university that to see it go away is to really see a major piece of the university's history go away. But the more general observation is that this period from 1945 to 1950, again, in my mind, is perhaps the most significant period in the university his university's history because of the crisis the university confronted, because of the fortuitous geographic relationship that the university had with Fort Douglas, and because of this acquisition of land and building that allowed the university to continue its operations through the crisis. And with that, I'm happy to open up uh, the floor to any questions. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, let me get my video turned back on. That was super cool. And you know, I don't often think about the the makeup of the student body, that video that you showed, it was really striking that those were families living in those barracks. And so not just getting around on campus, but families who have to get off campus for jobs, for groceries, for childcare. Um, that poses significant challenges too about how people are using the space on campus and getting around. Yeah, I mean, 
And the reality is that housing was kind of tough after World War II. I mean, you had, uh, generally speaking, not just for the university, but, you know, you have this, all of these uh, thousands of people returning to uh, Salt Lake City. Um, the housing situation in general in the community was something of a crisis as well. So the fact that there was a two-year waiting list for Stadium Village is not necessarily a surprise. Yeah, and feels familiar. Um, so Julie Myers has her hand up. Julie, would you like to unmute and ask your question? You bet. Hey, um, just uh, my, my parents were up there in the 50s, so my dad graduated from the annex. That's what he says. Uh -huh. He didn't graduate from the University of Utah. Graduated from the <laughs> graduated yeah. from the annex. So they lived that whole thing, going back and forth, and and the whole bit. But I I too am am sad to see the annex uh, go. You think that they could remodel the inside and leave the structure? I I don't know. Who knows about the powers that be? But I spent a lot of time in those in those buildings too for my university. Uh, studies, but do you know what they're doing with the space and um, now that they are going to take those buildings down? Well, the, I, I can I can tell you about the annex. In the short term, it's going to be a parking lot. Um, I don't know what the longer term plan is. My hope is the longer term plan would be for something that has more value. It would certainly be a shame to tear the annex down to make it a permanent parking lot. That would be, to me, a travesty. But I think my guess is the plan, uh, and there may be somebody in the audience who can answer that question with the longer term plan for that. That's a lot of space to, to leave as a parking lot, even in this day and age when parking is something of a premium. Yeah, I agree. And you know, the, all of these Western campuses are very automotive focused um, in a way that they aren't necessarily on the East Coast. And that does present particular challenges out here. Um, so, you know, Fort Douglas wasn't necessarily built with, well, obviously wasn't built with automotives in, li in mind, but it was built with the need for open space in there. Um, so how did that, did that impact people's ability to drive to these buildings? Um, you mentioned that, you know, traffic and parking were an issue. Can you explore a little more on that subject? Well, um... The traffic, you know, it's kind of surprising. I, I'm actually doing a study right now of the annex uh, to, to document its history before it's demo, or, or at least as it's being demolished. And one of the things that surprises me in my research is the fact that traffic was such a significant issue then mm -hmm. um, that uh, if you had a class on President's Circle and you had to get up to the annex, you'd just as soon get in your car and drive up there as walk. I, I guess I understand from a sort of a physical perspective that maybe walking a mile in each direction isn't particularly attractive to a lot of people. But the, the, the traffic became such an issue that the university actually built a road that basically cut through kind of by where the union building is now and then sort of arced its way up towards the annex mm -hmm. to try to accommodate this flow of cars. Uh, and parking, of course, was a significant issue um, uh, related to that. So even back then, uh, you know, there was there was this problem with uh, with traffic management. Part of that too, I think, is that um, you know, in the 1950s, the automobile was still a relatively new thing for a lot of people. I mean, it was kind of a an exotic uh, an exotic thing, and so it was kind of cool to get in your car, you know, and and turn on the Beach Boys, I guess, and drive up to the annex uh, for your next class. Yeah, cruise the. Cruise the campus, right? Cruise campus, yeah. Um, Kevin Johnson um, has a couple of comments um, and a question. I've always wondered why we call it the annex. You know, that is a great question that I have not been able to definitively answer. Um, in all of my research, I haven't found a, uh, a, a a sort of a day on which somebody took a bottle of champagne and smashed it against the corner of the building and said, I christened you the annex. It was, its role during World War II was actually fairly significant. It was the administrative headquarters for the ninth service uh, area, which was uh, a function of the army that, that, that encompassed a whole broad range of, of roles, including things like hospitals, uh, internment camps, uh, motor pool. Um, and 
it it sort of might have been referred to as the administrative annex um, in, during that period, but I, I couldn't find anywhere where that was the reference. Um, so the term the annex probably came from that period from World War II um, and just kind of stuck around. But it, again, I haven't been able to find a, a, a source that says this is when it was named the annex or this is why it was named the annex. Interesting. Yeah, uh, that's a, it's a, it's an interesting name. Um, <laughs> Kevin Johnson also asks the Minidoka Japanese internment site in Idaho still has standing buildings, which as expected, look just like the buildings did on the University of Utah campus. So yeah, I don't know what the standards were for construction of, of buildings at the internment camps. They were probably basically the same, you know, probably the same set of plans that barracks were constructed, you know, for which barracks were constructed on Fort Douglas. Um, you know, most of these buildings, again, the ones that were constructed at Fort Douglas were not fancy. You know, they were strictly utilitarian and certainly you would say the barracks that were constructed uh, at the internment camps, unfortunately, had the same had the same quality to them. Um, so my guess is, you know, they just took plans from the War Department and built a bunch of barracks at the various internment camps based on those plans. Hmm. Okay. What would you say was the most surprising thing that you learned about the annex? Other than, you know, we don't necessarily know where its name is coming from. Is there anything that you didn't know that, that really took you off guard? You know, I think, I think the most surprising aspect of the annex to me is that, um, and this may seem sort of counterintuitive, but I was struck by how big it actually is. I mean, 90,000 square feet, that's a really, I, I'm not sure, I don't know off the top of my head the square footage of every building on campus, but certainly this has got to be one of the biggest buildings on campus. Mm -hmm. It's not a building that you really can take in in its entirety, so its, its overall size can be a little hard to comprehend, but the fact that it, it represented about 30% of the square footage of the university um, at the time that it was uh, acquired by the university is really significant. So I think the just the size of the building um, uh, was really what struck me the most. 30%? Yeah. That's massive. That's, that's it a, is massive. It's a huge footprint. Yeah. Wow. Um, and Julie Myers asks, talking again about um, military buildings, were many military buildings moved to other areas in Utah? The buildings that, I, I don't know the answer to that, Julie. I, the buildings that were on Fort Douglas, I think by and large, once the university had used them, they were done. Um, I don't know that, you know, in our neighborhood, we have seen some, what appear to be some buildings that were converted to houses. Um, so maybe some of them moved uh, around, but I, I didn't follow the trail of the buildings after the university had used them. Mm. So I can't answer that question in detail. My guess is by the time the university was done with them, most of them had outlived their temporary status and they probably weren't really worth um, salvaging at that point. Okay, yeah, I think that's probably a good sense. Um, having personally gone to school in trailers, <laughs> it, there's only so many times you can move those things before yeah you're not getting any value out of them. Yeah. I believe I you have a can question. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I just can't figure out how to raise my hand. Otherwise, oh. so I just muted. Um, those of us of a certain age, remember, somebody is welcome to correct me if I'm hallucinating this. Remember in the 60s during Vietnam that uh, one of those old barracks, what we used to call those old barracks, was burned down by a bunch of protesters. Uh, is that a true story or am I just uh, a child of the 60s and don't remember it? I remember this being on the news. I mean, I remember, I, I think I was in high school at the time. It was still during Vietnam. Anyway. I think I might have run across a reference to that. I, I don't I don't recall that specifically. Um, I know that there was actually a lot of activity, so to speak, on campus during that period. And it concerned university administrators uh, greatly. Uh, in fact, this is not necessarily related to your question, Kevin, um, but the design of the landscape in, on the basically the west side of the Union Building 
was uh, was done specifically so that you wouldn't have a large open area where people could congregate. So you have this sort of hilly, you know, if you can picture kind of that hilly area in front of the, the union building, that was intentionally designed that way so that students, you know, couldn't sort of come together en masse and, and form, you know, some kind of protest. Um, but I don't, I don't have the specifics about the barracks. If somebody else does, I'd, I'd welcome them chiming in. In the chat, Stephen Godby says it was the ROTC building. Which would That's make helpful. sense. Yeah. Um, does that help you, Kevin? Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, and Elizabeth Giro, a fellow architectural historian, she has a question as well. Elizabeth? Hi. I just want to know um, if. Rocco Siciliano, who was in Eisenhower's cabinet and was a local boy, South High graduate, made good, uh, had any role that you know of. I have his biography and I just quickly thumb through the index. I don't see anything where he discusses, maybe he was too modest to say, I kind of put a little bug in the president's ear to get that land but I wondered if you found any connection there during this period of growth of his role in helping the university while he was in the Eisenhower cabinet. You know, I haven't, I, I haven't run across his name, you know, the timing of, so first of all, the, the Eisenhower influence uh, is kind of almost to be frank, bordering on urban legend, I think, cause mm -hmm. I couldn't, in my research, I never found uh, any reference to, to Dwight Eisenhower saying, you're going to do this. I think he might have said, come on, you know, let's something a little less direct, if you will. The other issue is um, because the transfer was uh, completed in 1948, I don't believe that Dwight Eisenhower was president at that time. I was trying to find a reference to when he was elected, somebody else who's a, more of a presidential historian could, could tell me. But if he was not president, uh, then he probably wouldn't have had the authority, and even if he was president, he wouldn't have had the authority to direct um, the War Department to give the land to to the university. But I have not run across Rocco Siciliano's name, and because I think this happened before Eisenhower was president, he and Eisenhower may not have been associated at the time that the transfer occurred. Thank you, and great presentation. Thank you. And we have time for a couple more questions if there's anyone else out there with some lingering thoughts. All right, Marina came through with a long question. Uh, Marina, do you wanna read this out loud or should I? I'll give you a second to unmute if you do want to read out loud. By the way, thanks. Oh, it was just more of a comment. I'm an archivist at Weber. Um, so it was just super interesting to see the similarities and differences between the U and Weber's uh, post World War II boom and how they responded. And I, I think all of the, you know, I don't know that the university was alone in confronting this kind of issue. I mean, it's not like every. A uh, veteran returning from World War II decided to go just to the university. I mean, I'm sure that all of the other institutions of higher education were experiencing similar uh, growths in enrollment. Um, the university was obviously fortunate to be located next to Fort Douglas and have this, this resolution basically right next door. Um, but I don't know the histories of, you know, Weber State and Utah State and, and even to that extent, BYU or some of the smaller schools like Snow College, what was then Snow College or, or what was then Dixie College. Uh, I don't know what they might have experienced during that period. Yeah, it was a it was a national boom. I, I do yeah. know that much. So yeah, widespread phenomenon. Um, I think our last question for this afternoon, Julie Myers asks, is there any more information you can share on President Olfen's role in creating research at the university and creating Research Park? Um, research Park would have happened pretty much well after President Olpen. He, I'm trying to think of when he left, um, but he was there, I believe, through about 1960, I wanna say. 
Um, and then the next president was President Fletcher. Research Park would not have been developed until after that, although it's possible there was some uh, concept, I guess, that, that there might be a facility like that um, adjacent to the university. Um, as far as President Open's emphasis on research, um, uh, you know, Julie, I could just, maybe what I'll do is send you some information directly about that. Um, he came, as I mentioned, from Ohio State University, and he believed really strongly that it wasn't that he didn't believe in the, in the learning part of the university's role, but his real emphasis, his, his drive was about creating a research institution. And so you saw, for example, a good example of that is the Kennecott building, which is at the very north end of, of campus, um, was constructed as, as a partnership, if you will, with the Kennecott Corporation because President Olpin believed that the university needed to expand its interaction with the private sector in doing research. Um, and so he had a really strong bent in that direction. Awesome, that's really cool. Thank you. Man, you are knowledgeable on every single building on the university campus. <laughs> well, not quite. I mean, there are out, and there are a lot of buildings that have been built obviously more recently um, that are truly interesting in their own way that I don't know anything about. But certainly this period is one that I've been fortunate enough to research. It looks like Julie took herself off mute. Do you have a follow-up? Thank you for that. And there are so many buildings. You know, I often wonder what percentage of buildings on campus are actually research-related. Um, and, you know, just the construction over the years of those buildings and what they've done for the university. And it was it's interesting to know about Kennecott, but that Kennecott building did come about in Olpen's time. So uh, uh, thankful for that and his uh, leadership in research. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. <laughs> Great. We do have to um, close it down in just a second, but um, Kevin, did you want to follow up on something? I just had a thought and then we don't have time to discuss it. Probably there was a, there was a film at, at Sundance not long ago, several years ago called the ivory tower. It was about how we've gone from uh, higher institutions, institutions of higher learning uh, being largely for learning to being largely for making money. And as a result, how and how the architecture has changed with private donations. So, you know, those of us who went to Ballif Hall and went to, or lived in Ballif Hall and went to classes at the annex. Nowadays, that's all gone away because the way you attract students and the way you attract money is by having fancy buildings, not leftover World War II barracks, which I find pretty sad. That's interesting, though. Yeah. I agree, I guess as a, as a kind of closing observation, I feel like it is truly unfortunate that the university seems to be indifferent to its post-war architecture. And I understand there's pressure on the university, especially when somebody comes in with millions of dollars to build a new building. There's pressure to try to create increased space and so forth. But at some point, I think we're gonna have lost uh, most if not all of that built history. Um, and I, and I, just, I think it's unfortunate. Uh, one other note, I just wanted to say, if you have any other questions or comments, um, please feel, uh, forward them to Elizabeth. She'll forward them to me and we'll kind of do this roundabout response um, to, uh, to what you have. But uh, again, I appreciate everybody attending today. I hope that, uh, hope that you're able to learn something from this. Yes, thank you. And in the chat, I'm also putting in links to a few other events we have going on. If you are someone who has a building that they love. Um, did you know that there are tax credits available to help you protect and preserve that building? Um, we actually have a really great success story out of the BYU campus that our own Amber Anderson will be sharing tomorrow, not tomorrow, sorry, next week. <laughs> She'll be sharing that next week, same time, Wednesday at noon. Um, and then you can find all of our archaeology and historic preservation month events, including a special presentation on uh, Utah's military installments, the, the history and architecture of those will be in a couple of weeks. So you can find those on our blog at history.utah.gov. Um, so as always with these brown bags afterwards, tomorrow I will send you guys out. Everyone who registered will receive an email with links to things that we've discussed. And so um, if Bim Oliver has some other resources that he has to share, we'll get those out to you and you'll have my email. So if you've got any more questions for him, I will get those right over to him.
But with all that, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Bim. That was such a cool presentation. And thank Thank you you. all for joining us today. And we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody.